So it's my pleasure to introduce J. Kaylin Kaylin Wang. 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 Yeah. <laughs> um, I've probably been saying that for years. <laughs> um, she's an associate professor at the School of Computing at DePaul University, and she got her PhD at the University of Illinois in Chicago. Um, her research interests emphasize the application of machine learning and information retrieval methods in software engineering. And she is also the North American Director of the International Center for Excellence of Excellence for Software Traceability. I think she might talk about a little bit. Yes. And um, she likes to tap the large scale software engineering problems. So that I will be doing. Oh, and if you're in 209S and you didn't hand in your paper, you're supposed to give it to me. And I gave you the one that. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you everybody for coming today. And I'd like to thank um, Deborah and Dick and others who invited me to come here. It's a pleasure for me to um, come and talk about um, this topic today. As you can see, I have quite a long, highfalutin title for my talk. And um, the, the thing is, they asked me for the title of my talk about six months ago, and I hadn't completely decided exactly what I was going to talk about. So I thought I'll give it a kind of fairly big title, and then I can um, kind of pick some things that um, I want to talk about within this area. But one of, the, um, my, one of the things I'm really going to focus on today is basically something that bridges two different areas of the software engineering discipline. And those are the two areas of requirements and architecture and design. And um, most of my work is actually in the area of software traceability. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that, but that's kind of helps us make the bridge between requirements and architecture. And um, what I'm going to talk about today is kind of three aspects of this. First of all, we're going to focus on a particular kind of requirement that's um, architecturally significant that I'll talk about in a minute. But I'm going to focus on um, three things. First of all, how do we elicit and um, specify and analyze these kinds of requirements and then build um, and design a system that actually satisfies these kind of quality concerns? And then secondly, how do we preserve these quality concerns in our implemented and delivered um, architectural solution? And finally, what happens if we forget about them? How can we retrieve them? How can we rediscover them? Now, I'm going to kind of just pick um, certain um, kind of areas in each of those three topics and focus on those, but we're going to kind of cover these um, different areas. So the focus today is really on what um, we call architecturally significant requirements. And I'm sure everybody's kind of familiar with them. ASRs play a very strategic role in driving architectural design. And um, that means that they're often going to be critical to the success of the system. And you know, we might ask, what are architecturally significant requirements? They come in several different shapes and sizes. Sometimes they're kind of very functional in nature, but a lot of times they represent quality concerns like performance or maintainability or performance or, or those kinds of things. So we often refer to um, a specific class of, of architecturally significant requirements as non-functional requirements. Now, you know, some of you are probably all familiar with that term. Some people hate that term. The reason they hate it is because it sounds as if there are some requirements that really don't know what to do. They don't know how to function. But um, basically, it means requirements that um, specify not what the system's going to do, but something about how the system's going to do it. So they often act as constraints on the system. And um, one of the things from the requirements perspective that's actually interesting about NFRs is that people often kind of forget about them. So if you were to look at the requirement specification for a system, and um, you know, using that term in the broadest sense, you might find that there are very, very few non-functional requirements specified. Sometimes there's kind of like a few um, representative performance requirements and maybe something about security, but these are often the kind of like the unspecified um, requirements. So they're kind of qualities that people know they want to achieve in the system, but they're quite often missing from the kind of early stages of um, requirements elicitation. So we're going to um, kind of look at those a little bit. So my talk today has um, three different parts, as I mentioned previously. 
Um, first of all, I want to talk about um, architecturally significant requirements and their impact on the architectural design. And I want to take a, a bit of a focus on agile projects, um, primarily because the most recent project I've been working on was basically agile in nature. But the things I'm going to actually talk about ASRs can be absolutely applied to um, more traditional projects, so it's not kind of limited um, to agile projects. Then I want to talk about how we can establish and use trace links between quality concerns and code so we kind of understand the relationships, and these relationships are available to us to use during the maintenance of the system. So one of the things about traceability that people complain about is, first of all, that it's a lot of effort to create trace links, so we're going to kind of look at that a little bit. But secondly, people don't actually use them very, very much, even when you have them. So we're going to look at how they can be useful to us. And um, finally, if there's time, I'm going to talk a little bit about recovering some aspects of architectural knowledge, specifically architectural tactics, which um, link back to these architecturally significant requirements. So I'm going to start by talking about um, just ASRs in general. As I previously said, they're often just kind of like the ignored requirements, and they're not specified. And if you look through, um, I've done quite a bit of work with several different um, industry um, organizations working on large systems engineering projects, and these requirements are often not, you know, kind of not very well specified at all. And um, similarly, even in an agile project, you know, in an agile project, we're not trying to come up with an upfront. Um, kind of requirement specification, but very often, if you're working in an agile pro in an agile project, people will tell you about the functions that they want the system to deliver, and they won't really tell you. The stakeholders won't really volunteer to tell you about the quality concerns. And there's all sorts of um, kind of stories, you know, of actual of practice where people have assumed that the developers of the system understood their quality concerns and understood what they wanted in terms of performance or kind of reliability, but they didn't. And so in the end, the, the wrong system gets delivered and it doesn't actually meet the expectations of the customer. So we were um, working on a project um, that I'm gonna show you in a minute called TraceLab, and we realized in the early stages of our project that there were many competing non-functional requirements or quality concerns. So we had lots of different stakeholders and they wanted different things out of the project. And these basically translated into kind of conflicting requirements, conflicting architecturally significant ones. So we asked ourselves, is there a better way? Can we manage this effectively? And what I'm gonna show you at the beginning um, of my talk is an approach that we adopted, which basically is taken from kind of the HCI world, human-computer interaction. So some of you may be familiar with the use of personas, and probably when you've seen personas used before, you've seen them used um, for user interaction design. So you basically, you know, look at your potential users, you do um, some extensive kind of surveys, you classify or, or categorize your users and you create these personas. And then you use the personas to kind of to evaluate the actual design to make sure that your system's going to kind of perform the way that they want it to and they can interact with it. We used our personas in a completely different way. We use them to help us understand the, the kind of conflicting quality concerns better. And we use them then to, to drive the architectural design of our system so we can make informed design decisions. And I'm going to um, talk about that a little bit. But the examples that I'm going to use all come from a recent project that I've been working on, which is our Trace Lab project. So I want to spend a few minutes kind of explaining that so you have a little bit of context for, for the examples I'm going to give. So Trace Lab is a project that was funded by the National Science Foundation for $2 million. Um, it's a three-year project. We're in year three by now, so we're getting towards the end. Um, it was developed by collaborators at four different universities. DePaul is the lead university for this. And the idea behind TraceLab is to build a tool that could be used originally by traceability researchers so that we could um, share components with each other and so that you could actually design an empirical software engineering experiment using a kind of plug and play environment. So you could take components and you could plug them into some kind of workflow 
You could then execute your experiments. Um, you could you know, have components that process data, that run algorithms, that process the results, perform statistics analysis on them, and um, that we would use this to share the data, to share components, to share experiments, and to be able to comparatively evaluate our results against other researchers' results. So I'm going to um, show you just um, very, very quickly a very simple trace lab experiment. Um, so this is one particular experiment that we created in TraceLab, and um, this particular experiment was um, actually used for classifying requirements by type. So we basically built a, a, a machine learner, a classifier, that was able to kind of look through a big requirement specification and hunt for performance-related requirements or security-related requirements or maintainability-related ones. So. This, as you can see, in TraceLab, it um, basically have this kind of workflow. Each of these nodes represents an individual component that could be programmed in a number of different languages. We don't.